everyone. Welcome to Arthritis at Home. I am so happy to see you again. My name is Cheryl Cohen. I'm with Arthritis Consumer Experts, and we are the host of Arthritis at Home. It gives me incredible pleasure, as it always does, um, to be joining you today uh, with Dr. Susan uh, Bartlett. We're going to uh, do something I think which is going to be really fun and talk to our audience today about um, recent work that you presented at the American College of Rheumatology. Dr. Bartlett uh, is a professor of medicine at McGill University and an adjunct professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins Medicine. Uh, you're originally from London, Ontario, and you completed your master's in psychology at McGill and a PhD in clinical uh, psychology at Syracuse University and a postdoctoral studies at Johns Hopkins. Questions. Perfect. So okay. the first questions um, really relate to a really cool project that I watched you present virtually um, called From Where I Stand. Using multiple anchors yields different benchmarks for meaningful improvement and worsening in the rheumatoid arthritis flare questionnaire. So in lay language, um, this study, this piece of work is really about how people like me who live with rheumatoid arthritis can assess how you can assess, how I can assess what's happening in a flare situation. Am I getting better? Am I getting worse? Is that a correct summary? Exactly. Yeah. We wanted to identify meaningful change. Yeah. So we wanted to know when RE is improving or worsening to the point where your rheumatologist might want to make a decision, a different decision about your medications, may want to increase them, change them up a little bit, but definitely would want to see you. And so we developed a questionnaire, which we called the RA Flare Questionnaire, or RAFQ. Yeah. And this was part of a very large initiative that I was involved in. This is a questionnaire that we actually co-created with patients starting, oh, more than 10 years ago. And then we conducted Adelphi with 125 patients in 10 countries and 108 rheumatologists from around the world in 23 different countries. So this is really an international. Holy smokes, I had no idea the scope was that broad. The RAFQ has five domains or five questions that we ask about, and it includes pain, physical function, fatigue, stiffness, and participation. And participation is, can you do the things you wanna do, not just the things that you have to do? And participants respond using an 11 point NRS. In fact, so it's a really simple questionnaire. It takes 30 seconds or so to complete. Uh, patients loved it when we finished it and debriefed it with them. And one of the things that's happening as the RAFQ is getting much broader use is that both professionals and patients asked us, well, what is meaningful change in a score? In other words, how much does my score need to change before I know that this is not just kind of that day-to-day -day variability or I'm not just having a bad day or day or a couple of days, but something is going on. Inflammation is getting This is so worse. relevant, Susan. It's unbelievable because it's the thing we struggle with the most. Should I be worried? Should I be doing something? And very rarely do you get an answer back. Well, so and that's what, the, that's what the purpose of this questionnaire is. So it takes you 30 seconds, you complete it, you look at what's happening over time, and we've been able to identify what are the meaningful change points. And that's really what this project is about. So we did it from three perspectives. We wanted to know what was meaningful change from the perspective of patients. What did they think was a little bit of change and what did they think was a lot of change, either improvement or worsening, where they really needed to see their doctor. And then we asked the rheumatologist, what do you think is a meaningful change? We didn't just ask them the scores. We had them actually look at patients when they were much worse or much better. And we looked to see how much the score had actually changed. And then we anchored it back to CDI, which is the disease activity level that's most commonly used in the office. So CDI is actually used to make treatment decisions right now, most of the time in Canada. If you want to put somebody on a different um, treatment, you may need to provide the change in the CDI scores. Right. So we wanted to have that information too. What we found was there was a difference in the scores. For instance, if patients were improving, um, they reported a smaller score change than if they were worsening. So in other words, if you went into your doctor and you said, I'm a lot better, yeah. your score had changed on average six points. 
If you said you were a lot worse, your score had changed nine points. Wow. So there's this asymmetry. And we think that what that might mean is that um, patients are just more conservative. It takes a larger amount of change before they're willing to say, I am definitely worse. Which is not good, obviously. It's not good. It was a huge surprise, as a matter of fact. because. Really? We had gone into it, and certainly the rheumatologists had gone into it, believing that the patients would say they were a lot worse when maybe the rheumatologists wouldn't agree. In fact, we found the opposite, that rheumatologists were much quicker to say, no, this person is definitely worse and we need to be doing something. For the rheumatologists, the change was only six points when people were a lot worse. For patients, it was nine points. So patients who are conservative and maybe a little bit too conservative, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, you that you're, data... worse, you're, def- you're definitely worse and your doctor is most likely going to agree that you're worse. And so well. Susan, those data are, we see that kind of disparity in other studies as well, don't we? So that this probably gives you confidence that this work, it's just one, it's additive, I think. I mean, it's super unique, but it's, it's sort of probably for you as a researcher comforting to know that yeah, research in these other areas also shows sort of something similar. It was really reassuring for me personally to be able to say to all of my colleagues, you you know, there is always this struggle around um, clinicians who say, but yes, I know they, they may say that they're worse, but are they really indeed truly worse? Yeah. Well, our data is very convincing. And again, it was collected in major clinical trials around the world. And, and there's absolutely no question that when a patient believes they are much worse, the rheumatologist nine times out of 10 is going to agree that they are much worse and something needs to be done. Yeah. Um, so, when you say that this is a tool that's been co-created, I'm going to assume that you are going to encourage the use of the tool also at home. So people can take the tool and use it in their own house. That, you know, they so, don't have to wait to, for a rheumatologist to tell them to take that test. We actually had been working as part of a, um, the OMERACT initiative. And when we presented the initial results of this questionnaire, we did so at the OMERACT meeting that was in Whistler, BC. So oh. it was really nice to bring it back home to Canada. We had about 40 patients at that meeting. And before we presented it to the group at large, I presented it to the p- patients just to see what their reaction was. And Cheryl, one of the first things I did was I asked everybody to complete the questionnaire. Oh. And I almost fell off my chair because the score ranges from zero to 50. 50 is the worst you could possibly ever be. I don't think that we would find somebody out of 50, but certainly when you're getting above 20, the rheumatologists told us scores above 20 are certainly reflective of inflammation at a level where they're really concerned and they wanna see the patient. Well, I had patients that were at this meeting that were scoring 35, 40, Wow. 44, and I literally stopped when I got their, when I looked at their questionnaire results and I said, how are you here? How are you functioning? Yeah. How are you sitting here? And that just shows you how skilled actually uh, people with RA are at coping, right? At adapting, um, which isn't necessarily a good thing when, right? Sometimes that can... I think- Stoic, yeah. you know, we've always talked about people yeah. with RA as being very stoic. Yep. Yeah. But, but this is, uh, yes, I, I mean, I think you get used to living with pain and you find a way to, to persist. Yeah. And, but, uh, you know, this was really beyond, um, beyond we persistence. You, we, don't, we don't want you persisting at that yeah. level. So, yeah. Um, that, was, that was one of the first big surprises. The second yeah. surprise was everybody around the table said, Can I take this with me? because they felt that the number that they scored at was really meaningful. And they they said, like, I wanna show this to my doctor. I wanna show this to my spouse. I wanna show this to my kids. Like, it's not in my head that I'm not feeling bad today. The number really reflects how I'm feeling. So I believe that the reason that the questionnaire works so well is because patients essentially told us what to ask and that's what we did. Yeah, it is for me the best example. If you want to make a really good, high quality questionnaire, you just need to find out what are the right questions to ask. 
ask them and then make sure your scoring is, is working the way that it should. Let's talk about the range of scores that would suggest all, you, their RA is in good control. So what's the, what's the upside of the tool in other words? So um, again, we asked patients about this and we asked clinicians about this. And most were very comfortable that if your score was somewhere between zero and 17, then you were in reasonably good control. Okay. Um, in other words, uh, yes, you know, as you as the score gets higher, that's indicative of more inflammation, and that's mm -hmm. not great over time. But it's certainly very consistent with being either in remission or low disease activity. Okay. Are rheumatologists in Canada and the U.S. are they going to know this tool? How do we use it to help our case, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. I mean, you can just look at the, the questions and the numbers and immediately it's very intuitive what's going on. So that's really the, the beauty okay. of this questionnaire. Okay, we needed great. to do this study because we need to publish these values. That's after we publish them and it gets into the scientific literature, that's when it gets picked up by rheumatologists and used in practice more frequently. Okay. But okay. I guess is five years from now, yes, your doctor will definitely be familiar with the RAFQ. Today guess, maybe not so much, but you just bring in the, the results. I guess the RAFQ and I think about it and I think about using it myself and I will here at home, is it's a really good way of organizing your own thoughts and reporting back. If if at the very least, Dr. Yep. Bartlett, that's how we use it at home. I think in the beginning, it probably makes sense to take it a few times. Yeah, Just okay. To, what's your baseline? What, what's your average number? And then, you know, we're going into the holidays. And the holidays uh, it can result in a lot of fatigue, Stress. lots of activity, yeah. lots of other things. So, you know, it may make sense to just once a week or something, try completing it and see where you are. I think the real value though is, is as you say, Cheryl, if you're not feeling well and you haven't been feeling well for a couple of days, then, you know, to be able to use the questionnaire and see, am I changing and how much am I changing? Yeah. Yeah. And is this change only going in one direction? And if yeah. it is, then you need to pay attention. Really smart uh, questions, obviously. And uh, there you go, audience, from Dr. Bartlett. That's your Christmas present, your holiday gift from her to you is keep track of what's going on um, during it, what is always a very stressful time. I mean, it's supposed to be happy, joyous, peaceful, loving, but sometimes that's not how the body takes it if you're living with rheumatoid arthritis. I want now, to another you. piece of good news, Cheryl, yeah. and I hadn't intended to talk with you about this, but you know, in doing this work, we had met with so many patients. What we learned from patients was really incredible, which is that when their inflammation starts to act up a little bit, they have different things that they do that really help them to turn things around. Yeah. I think you've heard me say this before. My favorite quote was the chocolate and duvet day where one patient talked about, I go in my room, I shut the blinds, I get into bed, I put a bar of chocolate that I love beside me and I just take the day off. And many times that can turn things around. Mm. So, Very interesting. you know, this, this can be the tool that reminds you, I need to slow down. I need, yeah. I need to take it easy. I need to cancel a few things and just uh, give myself a chance to give, give yourself a break. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Bartlett. We're really thrilled to have had this time with you. Thank you for the generous amount of time you've given us. Take care, everyone. Thank you for joining. Look at the slide at the end. Uh, which will have some links uh, so that you can uh, have some more learnings at your own leisure. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody.